Uh, my name is Tiffany Rausch. I'm a partner in the construction practice group here in Houston. And I'm Cindy Muller. I'm a partner in the Houston office. I'm in the Maritime section. I'm the Houston office head and the co-chair of the firm's offshore wind initiative. Okay, so the title of our section is Boomerangs, How Indemnity and Related Clauses May Come Back to Haunt You. If you've ever heard one of my presentations, I like to do uh, things like boomerangs and carry it through. So I've also called this a loophole before, and you can also call it a trap, but it's essentially this concept that the contract giveth and the contract or state law, we're gonna talk about both aspects today, taketh away. And the idea is you've mitigated risk with one contract provision and then you turn around in another provision or by state law and that risk gets boomeranged back to you. So Cindy's mostly gonna cover the indemnity for breach of contract issue. She's gonna really look at delay and warranty under that and how that risk that you mitigate ends up coming back in the limitation of liability exclusions. And then I wanna talk a little bit about anti-choice of law statutes. Um, I'm sure even if you're not a lawyer here, you know that state laws can be very different on really important key risk management and uh, exposure issues. Con states around the country have these anti-choice of law statutes that apply specifically to construction contracts. We're gonna look at some of those and then we'll talk about how the uh, different state laws can impact your risk. So we're gonna talk about indemnity for breach of contract, but at first I wanna kinda of orient the two, all of you on how it is Tiffany and I work together. So when I first got to Jones Walker five years ago, uh, I used to geek out with Tiffany talking about indemnities and the anti-indemnity statutes. And I kept trying to get her to become a transactional lawyer like me. And so for five years I stopped her around the Houston office in the kitchen and in the ladies room to talk about indemnities. Um, actually true. <laughs> this is all true. <laughs> and persistence has paid off. And so I got this really squirrely contract and I was looking at the indemnity provisions and I'm like, I don't know if this means what I think it means. Let me go talk to Tiffany. And I set the hook and then I landed her in the boat. There's my maritime analogy. And the two of us now negotiate contracts together. And then we advise clients when their contracts start of start getting a little hairy when they have change order issues or other disputes with their clients and then somewhere between transactional and litigation we do a handoff and if you're going into a courtroom or an arbitration you want Tiffany there not me because I don't remember the evidence rules anymore because that was the first third of my career and so that's the story of how it is she and I work together and how it is we wrestled this bear of an offshore wind EPC contract. Um, so one thing to keep in mind about an offshore wind project is there is not one large EPC wrap contractor that everybody rolls up to and that EPC contractor manages all of the interface risks of all of the subcontractors. Instead, what the owners do is they subcontract six or seven different EPC scopes of work and the way they manage that interface risk is in large part they push it down to the contractors. And so this is the story of one indemnity contract um, one EPC contract and the indemnities and the way that we tackled it together. Um, lovely illustration, of course, you know Tiffany did this because there's no way I would have figured it out. Um, one thing to be careful about, if you think about, I come from an old oil and gas offshore marine indemnity perspective, you're used to knock for knock indemnities, indemnity for pollution, you leave everything else at law and the world is fairly simple. That is not what you see in construction contracts. They will throw in broad-based indemnities, sometimes they're negligence-based, instead of knock for knock, and they're go going to throw in an indemnity for a breach of contract and an indemnity for a breach of every rep and warranty you've made in the contract. And so that when you look at those kinds of indemnities, of course, that broadens your indemnity obligation, but you've got to look for when those indemnities then come up to boomerang on you because you will think you have a consequential damage waiver. What do contractors look for? We wrote an article together, see there's a theme going on, called Three Sheets to the Wind, that the three sheets to protect contractors are a liquidated damages provision, that is the sole and exclusive remedy, and is capped at a fraction of the contract price, a waiver of consequential damages, and an overall limit of liability. Those are the three provisions that prote protect the balance sheet of a contractor, 
because those risks are largely uninsurable. And without those, contractors are taking risk outside, uh, larger than the size of their contract. But when you look at the indemnity exclusion that almost always shows up in a consequential damage waiver and in a limit of liability, if you're not careful about what's in your indemnity, the exception in your protections could swallow the protection. So you're working the clicker because I haven't figured out how. We're not okay. going to go back there. So. Yeah, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm good with that. Um, so up, I'm not going to read the language to you, but here is the language that was originally presented to us that we would defend and indemnify um, all third-party actions and a long list of things, anything you can think of, for any breach of any obligation in the contract. There was a parallel provision that in, required indemnity for any breach of a rep or a warranty in the contract. So super broad indemnities. So two of the critical breaches that, I mean, we could sit here and come up with hypotheticals that we could worry about all day long, but the biggest ones that we were concerned about is delay. Because despite all of the project managers in this world and all of the project planning, 70% of all construction projects still end up delayed. And so if you aren't planning for delay on your project, you might be being a little bit unrealistic. And so you need to be able to cap your delay liabilities, limit them somehow, or manage and control them. So if you indemnify for any breach of any obligation, and you have an obligation to meet a schedule, or you have the dreaded time is of the essence language in your contract, are you then indemnifying for any claims by third parties caused by your delay? Think about that in an offshore wind context. Think about that on the knock-on effect of the following contractor coming behind you who's sitting and waiting on you to finish your scope and you've overrun your schedule and now they're on standby. And God help you if that's an offshore vessel that's billing out at $500,000 a day because those delay damages are running up the tab. Um, what about the breach of the owner's contract with others? Because this is a claim by any third party. If your breach caused them to breach their contract, do you owe them indemnity for their liability under that contract? Think of a power purchase agreement and the offtake agreement with an electrical grid. I don't think there's a contractor in this world that thinks that they're taking on owner liability for the breach of their contracts. Warranty defects. Let's say you provide a large, you do install, and you manufacture, and you manufacture and you install. If your work is defective, you expect to go out there and repair your work. What you don't expect to do is then indemnify for any and all damages caused by your defective work. So let's say you provide a widget, just a widget, that is built into a much larger piece of construction, and your widget is defective. Are you gonna be liable for all of the damage because of your defective? No, you're a supplier. You're like, hey, here's a new widget. Please take it, good luck to you. But if you indemnify for any and all damages for any breach of any warranty, are you liable for the rip and tear responsibility to take everything out that was built around your widget, then you've gotta give them a new widget, and then you gotta put everything else back in place. So that's what people call rip and tear liability. When you sign up to that big, broad, vague indemnity, have you just bought that liability? Are you willing to take the risk? Do you want to have to hire Tiffany to litigate it? I suggest no. Sorry. I suggest yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's my suggestion. <laughs> what about damages to other work caused by your own defective work, right? So your widget fails, and it's not just that it failed. It then causes damage to other work. Well, the good answer to that is your comprehensive general liability policy probably covers your liability if it's a completed operation, not for the damage to your thing, but the damage your thing causes to other work. But you better make sure you've talked to your broker before you rely on that. Ideally, you would limit your liability to just repairing your defective work and not take on any other damages related there too. But again, if you agree to it in indemnity, but your warranty provision is locked down tight, what does this indemnity do to that warranty provision? And then the other thing is you've got to defend the owner. It's not just an indemnity. You've got to defend them. So if they've got liability under these third-party contracts, are you defending them? 
Well, they're not going to let you defend them. They're going to defend themselves, and they're going to send you the bill from their lawyers, right? And owner's lawyers are usually a lot more expensive than contractor's lawyers. And you'll be paying for defense and indemnity under contracts that you've never seen before. So it's something to be very careful about. So that's a broad indemnity. And I think you're going to guess what my recommendation is to do about that kind of an indemnity. But this is the boomerang effect of that broad indemnity. You're like, yeah, yeah, but we got a consequential damage waiver, right? Yeah. That's really where the rubber meets the road. That's where, as an in-house lawyer, you've got to protect the company's balance sheet. You've got to get a consequential damage waiver. You've got to get a limit of liability. And then you know at least you're not betting the farm. But not if the exception to your consequential damage waiver and your limit of liability is everything in your indemnity clause. Because they've just snuck in. See, Tiffany is like, oh, it's complicated, and the contract takes it away. I'm like, no, no, I think it's a trick. It's a trick. They're being tricky. So if, you've got, if, if you owe indemnity for a breach of every single obligation, and that is an exception to your consequential damage waiver, what does a consequential damage waiver apply to? The answer was, it applies only to our loss of profits. Oh, so it doesn't apply to your liability under another contract, which is typically the definition of a consequential damage? No, it doesn't apply to that. That's an exception. So then it's really just a waiver of the company's own lost profits, which arguably are direct damages. So it was a very tricky and confusing provision. Um, so what did we look at? What exceptions should you be willing to accept to a consequential damage waiver? Probably indemnity for bodily injury, property damage, pollution, the kind of things you have insurance for probably those operational risks that you manage tightly inside your company, like your liability for taxes, because you're going to pay your taxes. Um, liability for liens, because you didn't pay your subs. You're going to pay your subs. You're going to have to get lien waivers, so you won't be able to. Liability for intellectual property infringement, you're going to have a hard time winning that argument that, that, is, that they're waiving consequential damages on that, because it's probably the only damages they have. Same argument on breach of a confidentiality. That's a lot to give without giving breach of contract and breach of rep and warranty. Next slide. So kind of the same thing on the limit of liability, except the limit of liability is what makes everybody sleep at night, that we're never going to lose more money on this contract greater than x. But it's got exceptions. And the question is, what exceptions are you going to allow? Because if breach of contract is an exception to the limit of liability, you don't really have a limit of liability. And so that is the boomerang, the trap, the trap door. The trap for the unwary is really what it is. So again, only allow those same exceptions. Um, and think about when there are these exceptions to these protections that you're relying on. If all of those exceptions are are not covered, then what is that waiver of consequential damage and what is that limit li of liability really protecting you from? And then you have to know your project and you have to know your operations and know what is the biggest risk on this project. This is when in-house lawyers have to talk to project managers and vice presidents of operation and say, hey, look, I'm just a lawyer. I think delay is always the biggest risk. But what is the biggest risk here? You know what? The G&G is kind of screwy. This, whatever. You don't know what it is. But if you don't understand what those risks are, you can't properly edit that limit of liability and waiver of consequential damages to make sure you're fighting for what it is you really need to fight for. Because it's always going to be a negotiation. <laughs> Uh, so this is basically what Cindy just outlined, right? You're the piling contractor, let's say, and you are the, let's say you're first in the line. You've got to go out there and lay the piles before they can do the, the turbine erection. You're late or you've got a defect that you've got to go back and repair. And now you've got your work has delayed the turbine erection. So the turbine erector says, hey, owner, you owe me. I've been standing by. You've got to pay me this amount. And the owner says, well, here you go, contractor, piling contractor. You pay me for whatever it is that you cause them because you owe me indemnity for all those third-party claims. And it's not excluded for consequential damages, and there's no limit to your liability, and it's not insurable. 
how do you even price that into the contract was the question Cindy rightly asked of the opposing lawyer. How do we go to our business people and say, this is what our exposure is. We have no idea. It could be the entire project. And that's the next slide. Imagine you're down here on this end and you are the potentially responsible for causing all of these successor contractors to incur delay because of something that you put, did. You were delayed. You caused them delay. And that gets all the way down, as Cindy said, to the power purchase agreement. And now you're, now you're actually liable through the third party claim for lost profits and loss of use of the project. That's what, that's what the language that we were dealing with would have set up in this contract. And we had a really, really hard time <laughs> convincing the other side, the owner, I'm not gonna say who, because hopefully they're a client someday, that <laughs> this was not going to work. We, we literally just could not, our client could not take that risk. And I'm happy to say that we had a client that um, was not so desperate for the work that he was willing to take that risk. And he closed up his binder and walked out of the room. Um, and two years later, we finally signed a contract. But it took a very long time and a lot of arm wrestling and Zooms. Um, anyway, it was a whole lot of fun. Um, so how to avoid the boomerang at contract negotiation. Um, I, if you know me well, you know I've got all kinds of other inappropriate ways to describe the situation you're in. Um, so how do you solve for it? My first answer is just say no. It's like, why do you need an indemnity for my breach of contract? You can sue me for breach of contract. You don't need an indemnity for that. Now you're saddling me with a defense obligation and you've upset the entire balance of the risk allocation in the contract and now we've got to go back and look for every other provision in the contract where this undoes what it is we've negotiated for. We've got an LD provision, that's the sole and exclusive remedy, but now you've got this indemnity. Which one takes precedent? We've got a warranty, maybe we, and it's limited and we've disclaimed all these other warranties and maybe we've got a sublimit on our warranty liability. Well, what takes, what takes precedent? Is it the indemnity? or is it the warranty provision? Why would we accept that amount of ambiguity in a contract when a cap on LDs and a limited warranty obligation are some of the fundamental risk management tools that contractors use? And so those are some of the arguments we made. We just said no. We're not going to indemnify for breach of contract. We're not going to indemnify for breach of any rep or warranty. And we're not going to accept these broad all indemnity exceptions to the consequential damage waiver and the limit of liability. And then I'm telling you about a fallback position because you know where we ended up, right? The just say no doesn't always work. Most of the time it doesn't say, it doesn't work. And so you've got to come up with a fallback position where you ring fence the risks that you've negotiated for and you accept those that you can tolerate and still get the job and still do the work and still make a profit. So the fallback position was, all right, we'll, ex we'll indemnify for breach of contract and breach of rep and warranty, but we're gonna exclude from that any other provision in the contract that has its own provision and limit, like the liquidated damage provision. In that case, it was a liquidated damage provision. We didn't have a warranty sublimit because the, pro the project was one that it's like one and done, and it either works or it doesn't, and if it doesn't, you've gotta just completely redo it. So there was no point in having a warranty sublimit. Um, don't include your breach of contract and breach of warranty indemnities in the exceptions to the consequential damage waiver and the limit of liability. And so here's the revised language that we ended up with. Um, you can see here we've carved out the LD provision from the breach of contract indemnity. So look, if we're late, you max out the LDs. And if we max out the LDs, you know what? You can put us in default. And that's it. We are not indemnifying you for every knock-on effect. And that default is going to be subject to the limit of liability, is what we negotiated for. And then on the consequential damage waiver, Tiffany did this. This was a really elegant solution. So this was the kind of indemnity provision where it says you indemnify for, and it's like 1 through 14. And it's just this laundry list of everything that they could think of. And breach of contract and reps and warranties were like buried in the middle. And so we reordered them and put them at the top and then excluded them from the exception. 
And it was just a much more elegant way of making the revisions so that it didn't look like we cut our wrist and bled all over the document. It was very simple. Um, and so what we allowed to be excluded, bodily injury and property damage. Why? Because you have insurance for that. If you, if you are trying to get revenue for your company and you're trying to protect your balance sheet, protecting your insurers when you've paid them premium isn't always your first priority. It's usually one of the things you give up. Pollution, same thing, covered. Liens, taxes, all the things that you should have controls in place. Fines and penalties for your own violation of law. Really, that's not one I'm gonna, uh, that's not a hill I'm gonna die on because there's no good way to sell that to a, an opposing party that you're not willing to take responsibility for fines and penalties when you violate the law. Um, IP infringement, breach of confidentiality as well. A, cli a client or a counterparty is gonna say, wait, you want to be able to share my confidential information and not be liable? That's a non-starter. Just, it's not one that's worth fighting over. Um, and then narrow the limit of liability exception. It's pretty much the same carve-outs. We, we, we cleaned it all up, and when you look at what your risk management tools are, You've got insurance for the bodily injury, property damage, and pollution. You've got sublimits for your LDs and your warranties. You've got a limit of liability that then applies to your breach of contract and your reps and warranty indemnities. So at least you've got something that's limited on those broad indemnities. And the only thing you've really left that is uncapped are things you should be able to manage, which are your liens, your taxes, your violations of law. And so we felt like this was a realistic and practical solution. And we got the contract done. Two years. But that's Two good. years. That's good. OK, so we're going to move to the second boomerang. And that is anti-choice of law. It says choice of law because that's the contract provision. But really, the thing that comes in and messes us up is the anti our anti-choice of law statutes around the country. I'm going to focus on three exemplar statutes because they're very different um, as far as they go uh, in New York, Louisiana, and Texas. Okay, there are three variations of how these statutes can look. So here's our scenario. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. You're a contractor in Houston. You do projects all across the country. Right now you've got a project that you're going to be doing in New York. And as uh, someone who works all across the country, and perhaps internationally, you want um, the great state of Texas, the law, and the venue to apply to all of your contracts for consistency and conformity. And so you put in there one of these great clauses, a typical choice of law provision. Uh, you've got Texas law will govern, venue is in Texas, You've included all of the uh, standards that there's no, there's a waiver of the conflict of law principles and you waive your objection to personal jurisdiction. You think you've got it all covered. And then you go to do your project in New York. And New York business, general, general business code 757 says, uh-uh, you're in my state, you're gonna apply my law and you're gonna litigate in my state. So New York law is uh, the following provisions of the contract shall be void and unenforceable. We're going to see a little bit different language when we get to Texas, but that's really important. Void and unenforceable if you want to make it subject to the laws of another state or if you want to litigate and arbitrate. Now I'm going to come back to arbitrate. Keep that in mind. I'm going to put a pin in that. But it says it in the statute. If you want to arbitrate and you have a project in my state, you have to have a seat in my state. Uh, or any other dispute resolution proceeding. Does that include mediation? And arising from the contract, conduct another state. So Tiffany, here in New York, um, need, none of the parties even need to be a New York domiciliary? You're getting ahead of me, Louisiana. Just a second. <laughs> so that is correct. You don't, none of the parties have to be in, the project has to be in New York. That's the issue, okay? So as Chris Lovely uh, uh, forecasted, in Louisiana, you have a little switch on that. So the project is in Louisiana, and the parties, one of the parties, not both of them, but one of them has to be domiciled in Louisiana. But then it does the same thing. The venue, including arbitration again, and the application of state law must be in Louisiana. It must be Louisiana law. Now, Louisiana gets very serious about this, because they say it's null and void, 
and unenforceable and inequitable <laughs> and against public policy. So I feel like they really mean business about this because all of those words are literally in that statute. And now we get to Texas. Kinder, gentler Texas mm -hmm. than New York or Louisiana. So we have the same thing, construction contract. You're doing a project in Texas. What Texas says is if you want to apply the laws of the states uh, or litigation or arbitration, it's voidable by the party obligated to do the work. Well, hey, that's you, right? Mm -hmm. That's great. Sounds like you have a great option. You can get to the end of the day and say, uh, wow, I really like Texas's law on this, so I'm going to enforce this. I'm going to avoid that um, venue provision that you have. Or, well, Texas isn't so good on this, so eh, I'll let it ride. Let's see what happens. Well, come along NRA MVP terminaling, which is a really interesting case. It's relatively recent, 2022. And what the court there said is, eh, you can waive that in your contract. So it's a bit of a head scratcher, if you ask me, because the statute literally says if a construction contract or agreement collateral to or affecting the construction contract contains a provision making the contract or agreement or any conflict arising, blah, 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 subject to the laws of another state. So it says if you've got a contract that tries to make you use the laws in another state or tries to make you have a venue in another state, you, contractor doing the work, can void that when you want to. But the NRA MP, MVP terminaling case said, well, this provision in the contract also said you waive your right to object to the venue. So we think that that's sufficient, and now uh, you no longer have the right to void it. Well, to me, it's a little bit odd because if you are agreeing to a different venue provision, aren't you already waiving your right to a venue? So what is it that the legislature was trying to do when they said it was voidable? Were they trying, were they trying to say that the owner just has to put in some waiver language in there? I don't think so. I think that what they meant was when it comes down to it, when the litigation is filed, the contractor has the right to decide, no, nope, I don't want to go with that venue. I want to be in Texas. Well, that's not the case under MVP. Under MVP, all you have to do is include in your choice of law and venue provision that the contractor waives any objection to venue. And then the statute will do nothing for you. I'm not saying it's wrong because the, the voidable language is a little difficult to deal with, I think. So remember I said we we're going to talk about arbitration. Each of these statutes provides that you cannot have a venue for arbitration outside of my state if you're contracting in my state. In 2001, the Fifth Circuit looked at this. This was a Texas owner, a Louisiana contractor. The Texas owner had in the contract that the arbitration would be held in Texas. Louisiana owner came in and said, mm, sorry, public policy, member void, unenforceable, inequitable, all those things. Well, the Fifth Circuit said, yeah, but that conflicts with the FAA. The FAA doesn't put that regulation or that restriction on arbitration, so that's not going to apply. It's preempted. Not, not going to fly. You can arbitrate in Texas. We don't care what the Louisiana statute says. It's preempted. In 2012, in this Cleveland case, the Houston court, the Texas court, followed that. They said the same, same thing. I think that was a Texas contractor, I'm sorry, a Texas owner and an Ohio contractor. And it follows the same scenario, right? The person who's trying to, to get venue files first, and then the other person files the arbitration, and so it goes back and forth. But the Cleveland court pretty much followed the, um, followed the OPE court, the Fifth Circuit, and found the same thing. FAA applies, preempts, you go have your arbitration wherever you want to. And we get down to this HBS 2015 case. Now HBS, uh, or sorry, this case is on the New York statute. So now the, the trial court, this is a trial court, Supreme Court, New Yorkers are weird. The trial court in New York said, um, well, 
So they did not come, the court did not come out and say, the FAA doesn't apply here. But I, that's obviously what they're talking about because the court says the subcontractor was local to New York. The, the subcontra, uh, subcontractor obtained most of his materials from suppliers local in New York. All meetings occurred at the project site. That seemed like a really weird one. Where else would you have them? Uh, and it did not matter to this court that these suppliers that were providing the materials also had offices all over. So just from the context of that, you can pretty much assume that the defendant who was trying to get the, the arbitration clause enforced was arguing, hey, this is, an inter this is interstate, the FAA should apply, it should be preempted, and the court just found, no, it shouldn't be preempted because it's not an FAA, it's under the, whatever the uh, arbitration law is in New York. Okay, madam. So now I'm gonna take you a little bit offshore and we're gonna talk about what happens with choice of law in maritime contracts or offshore contracts and how you could end up with state law applying even in a maritime contract. So generally, um, maritime law is, believes in freedom of contract and will enforce your indemnity even for gross negligence but not for willful misconduct. And so for that reason, a lot of people offshore who like knock-for-knock -knock indemnities are going to choose maritime law as their contract. But there are things you need to understand about maritime law. There are a couple of statutes like the limited liability statute and death on the high seas and things like that. But otherwise, there's not really a large body of maritime law. It's common law. And so as cases arise that are decided under maritime law and under kind of maritime doctrines, those cases evolve. But there's no products liabil liability law under maritime law. There's no UCC warranty under maritime law. And so when a court is sitting in a maritime case and maritime law doesn't govern a particular issue, they apply state law. They supplement maritime law with state law. What state law do they supplement with? Well, if you're sitting in a federal court in Louisiana, they apply the law of the venue. Same thing with Texas. It's great because you've got judges applying law that they're familiar with, but if you say that your contract is governed by maritime law, and you know, except for complex of law rules, and you think you've got it covered, you haven't chosen which state law needs to supplement your maritime law contract. And so you always need to include that in your choice of law provision, even when you choose maritime law, or you will end up with the law of a, you may end up with the law of a state you don't intend. So that's the first thing to think about when you choose maritime law. And then the next question is, well, what is a maritime contract? Well, a maritime contract is one that relates to activities on navigable waters where the parties expect the vessel to play a substantial part in the performance of the work. So all of those are terms of art and they mean different things. So navigable waters means what it kind of sounds like, like you can navigate on it, it's not a creek. Um, a vessel can be a pretty complicated question of fact on what is and isn't a vessel, does it float, does it have its own ability to navigate, things like that. Um, a substantial role, the test is more than 30% of the work. That comes from Jones Act and when a guy is a seaman and that's what the US Fifth Circuit has adopted um, and we'll see what the Supreme Court has to say about it if it ever gets there. But for right now, the rule of thumb is 30% of the work is from a vessel. Um, but just realize that that contract will still be supplemented by state law if you end up with a products liability case or you end up with a warranty issue. Um, insurance, there's no body, maritime body of law for insurance. So if you get into whether you've got an insurance coverage issue and you've been denied coverage and it's bad faith, you're going to state law on that. There is no maritime law on that. Um, why does it matter? Because people choose maritime law to be able to enforce their knock-for-knock -knock indemnities when they're offshore. Um, state law, by and large, has anti-indemnity statutes that in one way or another will invalidate an indemnity for somebody's own fault. And then here's the last kicker. When you're in state waters, which for most states in the Union are within three miles from the coast, but in Texas, because we're special, it's 12 miles. Um, also, Florida is 12 miles. Um, and it, I, I'll tell you why later if y'all are interested, but nobody wants to hear that now. Um, but once you are in federal waters and you're on the outer continental shelf, 
then the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act applies, and that's a federal statute, and there's no federal common law, and Congress recognizing that said, you know what? We're gonna apply the law of the adjacent state as surrogate federal law. So think of all of the people who work in Houston and in New Orleans, and we have these giant MSAs to work everywhere. If you're on the shelf, no matter what that MSA says, the law of the adjacent state's going to apply if you don't have a maritime contract, if you aren't have a boat doing 30% of your work, if you're on a platform, if you're on a substation, then you're on the shelf, and even though all of the parties are in Texas and you sign the contract in Texas, if you're off the coast of Louisiana, Louisiana law is going to apply to that dispute. And it's not a choice of law issue and whether the court will honor the party's choice of law, it's because it is surrogate federal law and it applies as a matter of law and they will not honor your choice of law. And so that is something everybody who decides that I'm really good at this offshore construction stuff, onshore construction stuff, let me see if I can go offshore, you need to understand that you're in a completely different world on choice of law. The Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act gives you no choice. It doesn't matter what your contract says. So just make sure you understand where it is you're working. And so as a lawyer who's been practicing law for 31 years in the US Gulf Coast, it's really easy to figure out where the line is between Louisiana and Texas. You got Cameron, you got Sabine Pass, and the minute you're in High Island, you're in Texas, and the minute you're in Cameron and West Cameron, you're in Louisiana, it's pretty easy. Now let's go up the East Coast for the offshore wind projects. How are we gonna figure out what's, what's the adjacent state? It's gonna be interesting litigation. That's one to watch. And as the indemnity statutes change, and some indemnities are enforceable, or the lien, the lien waiver statutes change, and you've gotta have a lien waiver that complies with the law of the adjacent state, what's your lien waiver gonna look like? These are all interesting questions that haven't been answered yet. When the East Coast becomes industrial, all of these lawyers who've worked in the Gulf Coast for a lot of years are gonna have some things to teach uh, the people in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. That thrills me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so Cindy was just kind of hitting on this, and most of the lawyers in the room, I'm sure, know this. Uh, for the non-lawyers, you probably know this too, actually. So the state, this matters, this issue is important because state law differs on fundamental risk profile of your contract. It matters on anti-indemnity statutes. Uh, every state has one. I, I won't say every state. I'll say nearly every state that I know of has one. And it can change uh, whether you can pass your pass indemnity, or I'm sorry, whether you can get indemnity for your own negligence. Uh, when you get down to waiver, some states have magic words you have to use for waiver. Some states will allow express waiver, will allow implied waiver, but not ex and express waiver. Let me switch that. Some states allow implied waiver and express waiver. Some states require express statement of waiver. When we get to notice, we talked about this a little bit earlier with Brad, I think, that whether you have to have strict compliance or substantial compliance. Pay if paid, Texas will enforce it, New York won't, so that makes a big difference. If you get to no damages for delay, Louisiana, if it's not in bad faith, it's probably okay. In Texas, there's a couple of other factors you have to meet, including that the, it was, this is delay that was comp contemplated by the parties and also that it wasn't unreasonably long. And then LDs, as I can't remember which presentation, but the unbridgeable discrepancy uh, for the look back on LDs in Texas, that's pretty unique. Uh, but each state has different ways of looking at these issues and it can change if suddenly the state law that you contracted for, you've negotiated, you've assessed the risk profile for, and by the way, your project team has been executing for X number of years, is no longer the law that applies to your contract, that can fundamentally change what you're dealing with. Okay, so this is just our closing, what to do, what to think about. It's beneficial, right, to have Texas law apply to each of your contracts that you have across the, across the country. So I'm not saying like never try to apply Texas law or a law that isn't the project of the state, but the state of the project where it's being built.
But just know if there's an anti-choice of law statute, um, know if it's waivable. And then regardless, something that Cindy has pointed out to me numerous times, your anti-indemnity statutes are likely, it doesn't matter. If you are in a state and they have an anti-indemnity statute, you will have to follow that because they will say it's public policy. We will not enforce uh, in, uh, indemnity for your own negligence unless you follow what our state says. I've seen in a, a few contracts where, this is particularly on the anti-indemnity part, uh, so the, the main contract provision for indemnity will basically refer to an exhibit, and the exhibit will say, if Louisiana law applies, then X, Y, and Z. If Texas law applies, then ABC. If New Mexico law applies, then CDF. There we go. Uh, so that's one way to handle indemnity, I guess. I, you certainly can't do that with every provision of your contract. And then Cindy mentioned the lien filings. So the lien filings, and I swear to you, I tried to find case law on this, but I just know it must be true. Uh, the lien filings have to comply with the state that you're in. And the liens are a creature of statute, so you have to follow the statute of where you're filing the lien, which means the lien where the project is. Just one thing on Texas liens, know that there's a statute that prescribes exactly what the lien waiver needs to say. Mm -hmm. And if you don't follow that, the lien waiver is unenforceable. So don't use your standard form, it works in every state, use the Texas statute lien waiver or it won't be enforceable. Okay. Questions? Any questions before we go? All right. Good deal.